Well, a November to remember continues for the Gamecocks as they take care of Kentucky, holding off the Wildcats to earn now their third straight win. And now it sets up a pivotal, a pivotal matchup against Clemson next weekend where everything's on the line, not just the state, but an opportunity to play in a bowl game. I'm Mike Eubin alongside me here at williams Bryce Stadium. It's former Gamecock offensive lineman Garrett Anderson. In turn, Joe is with us. If you guys want to be calling in, if you have any comments, Joe will be going through the comments section, whether it be on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, wherever. He'll share that, and we'll answer some of your questions as well. But before we get to the phone lines first, this game today, and it was funny because we were talking about it. We know when we talk about spreads and the money, and I know it's not based on who exactly is the better team. I think a lot of us look at it like that. But I bring that up, though, Garrett, because you were like, how are we favored in this game? Yeah. Um, bottom line is this. This crowd tonight was electric. It did not feel like a 4-6 and six team that these, this crowd came out and cheered for. Darude was here. It was absolutely incredible. Just your initial thoughts on what you saw tonight. I really do think the reason that we won tonight was because of the fans. And, like, that's not fan service whatsoever. I, like, I, multiple people that I talked to today, the first thing I said was, man, the stadium's electric. Like, we're in this game as a as the 12th man. Like, you know, it's a very, very invested program. Now, granted, there are a couple times where we were booing, which was rightfully so. Oh, my gosh, there's a couple things that were just driving us up the wall. But in terms of when the third downs mattered, when we needed the crowd noise, heck, it was the – they tried to get the playoff, and they uh, had to delay a game yep. because of the crowd because they couldn't they couldn't get to the uh, the head coach and that kind of stuff. I think the fans, quite frankly, earned this win tonight. I think if we, I think if we were quiet, we wouldn't have gotten that game. I put a tweet out earlier in the game, giving the fans an assist for one of the full starts they created. I think, and I don't have my sheet in front of me, but I think I counted about three or four of them tonight. So, yep. look, you go back to some of these games over the last couple of weeks, especially night games, though, right? You think back to the Mississippi State game. Even that Florida game, even though it didn't end well for you throughout the course of that game, earlier in, in the game, during that game against the Gators, we saw a lot of similar things. Yep. And when this crowd gets into it, especially at night, it's very difficult for teams to be able to come in here and beat. I will say this. I will say this. Offensively, yes, it was not one of the better performances. They found a way to get it done when they needed it to the most. And oh, surprise, surprise, it was Spencer Rattler to Xavier Leggett. With his performance tonight, Xavier moves into second now for the most yards in a season, in a single season in Gamecock history. He only trails the great Elshon Jeffrey, who his uh, jersey is up there behind us with so many other Gamecock greats. I bring that up. I bring that up, though, Garrett, because we've talked so much about Leggett this season. I don't want to take away from Spencer Rattler, but at the end of the day, you need a guy to be able to get open. They were double teaming the hell out of him all night. And when you needed him the most, he was able to find a way to keep doing what he's been doing all year. That last touchdown, I mean, you know, we were watching it the entire time. I think this is, you know, I am still an offensive line guy, so don't hold me to any kind of cover stuff. We'll have plenty of O-line talk because oh. I'm sure people have comments. Not a lot of good. But it seemed that they were very much a, a cover four, cover two team, kind of like the heavy man on the outside with the two safeties really covering over the top. And it was really funny. That last touchdown was because we got Leggett tight enough to run a skinny post between the two safeties in the in the, uh, in the the end zone for a touchdown. And quite frankly, I mean, Rattler was pressured. It was kind of a, you know, effort. He's down there somewhere kind of throw. And it was exactly where it needed to be. And, you know, it was a touchdown. And I think that I, we don't have a lot of guys that can do that. I, you know, I made this joke earlier today. For some reason, Carolina keeps on getting these like first, second, and third round receivers that are just phenomenal. And we got another one. And I, I would have never gone into the season saying Leggett's going to be the guy that we can just throw the ball up to and he'll give us a touchdown. But he's done that all year. It's ridiculous. And and look, I know the coaches, I know the players. They all said, "Hey, but we knew this was going to happen. We knew this was going to happen." I love Beamer. I love the coaches. I love the players. I think they're all great people, but no one expected this. No one expected this because let's call for what it is. No one expected Juice Wells to go down first and foremost. He doesn't go down. Xavier's not going to be able to get as many touches. He's not going to get as many yardage. Uh, the yard's not going to be there the same. But bottom line is those things did happen, and he stepped up, and he's been playing incredible. He's What, he's, what he did through the first four years, I mean – if you were just looking at a blind, res a blind resume and you're just looking at what he's doing this season, be like, who is this guy? But uh, bottom line is he's been doing incredible things. Uh, Joe, I want to toss it over to you, but real quick, Xavier yeah. will get six catches tonight, 94 yards, two touchdowns, of course, that massive TD at the end of the game to help the Gamecocks get the win. They were able to get that score up to 17 to 14. I know that obviously helped the Gamecocks, and I know that score also mattered to some of you out there as well. But what's just your initial thoughts, though, Joe, on what we saw this evening? 
Yeah, gentlemen, very big win for South Carolina. Um, you know, your bowl eligibility hopes are still alive and well. Um, you know, leaving the hopes up to the penultimate game of the season against our tribal Clemson next week. But um, you played well in all phases, defensively, offensively. Um, obviously, offensively, you kind of stalled out in the middle of the game there for a little bit, but um, you were able to get the job done when it mattered the most. Um, so execution in all phases, special teams was pretty good too. Um, so, I mean, just all around execution. If you're South Carolina, keeping the momentum going and Williams Bryce Stadium. Mike, I, I, I like the tweet that you put out earlier about saying that, you know, this team is, you know, four and six right now. And, you know, yeah. Bryce Stadium looks like that. Four and six heading, heading into the game. Yep. That's what you yeah. mean. Yep. Exactly. So I, I think it's a very, very big advantage. Um, and then obviously, there's if you need another reason to get up next week for Clemson, there's another one with ball eligibility still intact. Well, but. well, Joe, you mentioned there the phases, right? Now, again, yeah. offense, it wasn't a great night. They found no. a way when it, when they needed to. And I want to talk about special teams, but let's start with the defense, okay? Let's start with the defense. Yep. Over the last two weeks, and I'd say three weeks, right? But the, the, the two previous games, they beat Jackson State, they beat Vandy. And especially in that Vandy game, right, you shut out Vandy for the first three quarters. You held them to like 53 yards of offense through the first uh, two quarters, first half. Tonight, you only allowed six yards in the first quarter, negative one yard passing in the first quarter, and you saw what they were able to do tonight defensively. So that, that was incredible, okay? Like they have it – is, it is clear – that they're gaining momentum at the right time. It is clear they did that tonight against Kentucky. No one's saying that Kentucky's, you know, the 2000 or the, whatever it was, the, the 1999 St. Louis Rams, the greatest show on turf. But what I'm trying to get at is, and I'm not trying to bring up some PTSD, so bear with me here. Literally, the last time South Carolina played a night game in this stadium, it was about a month ago, and they were in a similar situation on this very field. You had about a minute to go. All you need is one stop and you win the game. All you need is one stop against Florida and you win the game. And unfortunately, as we all know, that didn't work out. Who do you think wanted that opportunity more than anyone? Clayton White, those defensive players, you have a chance to do something that few people in sports get, a redemption. Now, I'm not saying that makes up for what happened against Florida, but as a former player, could you imagine what was going on through those players' minds, especially knowing that they came up so short the last time they were in a similar situation? I don't think we've ever had an issue with effort in terms of our defense. You know what I mean? I, you know, I was actually one of the reasons why I posted on Facebook earlier was because you know, I posted whenever we had that first drive and our defense looked really, really good. And then you had a lot of times during the um, the game where we just kind of just puttered out. And I, I, I felt as if whatever Kentucky's adjustments were, were just better than our adjustments. And I think that's something that the coaching staff is going to definitely talk about in the, in the film room is because like, you know, our game plan coming in first drive offense and defense were phenomenal, but then you kind of watch it go on and on and on. And you realize that like, you know, our defense was playing aggressively, but we weren't getting into the quarterback's face. We weren't in coverage where we're supposed to be. And, Again, not a defensive expert, but I saw the calls. I know what Clayton was going for, but our guys were not in the positions they needed to be in to be successful. And so I, that's my issue, and I, I don't know what the answer is to it because there might not be an answer. But, um, yeah, our guys played hard. Like, I, I, I've i never watched our defense and said, man, they really don't want to be out there. They clearly want to be out there, but we got to find a way to get whatever get through their head yeah. that, where they need to be. Well, I shared this stat earlier in the week, and it's time to update it now, and it's a pretty crazy stat when you think back in terms of what we've seen from this South Carolina team in recent years. And I'm talking recent years. I'm talking the last two years. In the last two years now, in the last two years, when South Carolina plays at home, when they don't force at least one takeaway, they are 0-3. But in that same in that same time span, when they force at least one, which tonight they force three, they are now 10-0. 10-0. So, look, obviously, and I, stats don't always tell the full story. However, because it, it could have been real easy the, that ten, uh, that Kentucky could have won this game tonight, oh, despite the fact that you were able to get those takes just because of the way the offense is playing. But I bring that up, though, because let's call for what it is. We're standing here in the end zone near the student section. If Nicky Minwari doesn't have that interception in the end zone, yep. that's at least three points. That's at least three points. Yep. There were some opportunities where South Carolina forced the fumble. And I'm not even talking about the strip sack at the end. So, you know, look. Being able to create turnovers, and while South Carolina, at least the two previous weeks, they were very successful in being able to turn that into offensive production right, immediately right after. That wasn't the case tonight. But you look at those takeaways. If those don't happen tonight, this team doesn't win. 
by a long shot. And and that's one thing, you know, I, I can't remember who said it, but someone was talking about Kentucky being a pretty good defense. I, I could be quoting the stat wrong, but I think they're giving up on average 400 yards a game. And and I felt as if that was something that we did not take advantage of, which is funny because if you look at that and what's been our strength and what's kind of been, if anything, our crutch all year, is just Rattler being an S-plus tier talent and just getting us out of games. And funny enough, Kentucky's defense, shout out to their defensive staff because they knew exactly what we were going to run every single time. And so it, it was on our defense. And there were a couple more plays, and I hope our kids are – frustrated in film knowing that we could have had two or three more pick sixes i mean there was a couple moments where our defense could have ran the score up themselves look we're gonna have plenty of time to hold hands and sing kumbaya we've been giving this team plenty of praise tonight and rightfully so i don't want to get into speculating and making assumptions but the reason why and big red brings up about where's this defense all year i'm not saying this was the main reason but there's something that was different tonight there's something different when we got the dress list today Cornerback O'Donnell Fortune was not on that list. And all we've been told, and again, I don't want to speculate. I don't want to make assumptions. I don't want to throw someone under the bus until we have all the facts. But the bottom line is he was suspended. That was according to Todd Ellis on the 107.5, the pregame show. And I bring that up, though, Garrett, because the young corners that stepped up tonight, Judge Collier, and, and, and what they were able to do out there tonight, my goodness, my goodness. Yep. I, I bring that up because we talk about it in sports so often, especially with this team with the number of injuries they've gone through. And it's not just injuries. Again, when a player gets suspended, it's the same mentality, next man up, next man up. What USC's defense did tonight, if I told you, and, we, and it's not that Kentucky is a team that's throwing the ball over the yard, but you lose one of your starters on defense, and I tell you, hey, you had your best defensive performance of the year. And, again, that's – I say the best defensive performance. Certainly, they played really good last week against Vandy, but the competition's better going up against Kentucky. Yep. I thought this was their best defensive performance, and they did it without their starting corner. And I think one thing that you got to keep in mind, and this is what Clayton had to do a lot, is that you know when we rushed three or four, we were not getting pressure. He was getting four or five seconds to do whatever he wanted to back there. So we did a ton of cover zero, and cover zero is just dangerous, but it worked. You know, and that I think cover zero is more a testament to the guys who were in coverage giving enough coverage to where we don't get the ball off. And, you know, Kentucky made a lot of conversions here and there. But for the most part, when we have to do a bunch of cover zero stuff to get pressures and we don't give up, I mean, 14 points. Like, it's a good offense. I mean, that's that's impressive. I mentioned Judge Collier, but throw in throw in Jalen Kilgore as well. Both those young defensive back, true freshmen coming out there, having great nights. Jalen Kilgore finishes with five tackles on the night, had a pass breakup, also had a forced fumble, a big forced fumble. They targeted him a lot. And they did target him a lot. And then Judge Collier, three tackles tonight, two solo. But I, I bring that up because DQ Smith, Nick Eamon Worry, two young guys, and maybe it's because they played at such a high level last year, the expectation was – you know, a little high heading into it. It's just a caught a little bit. That it was be. high. It was, and rightfully so. But I say that because they bounce back tonight, especially Nick. But then you have these other young guys step up. What can this do, not just right now, but when you're talking about building the future? We'll have plenty of time in the offseason to talk about that. But with so much young talent, we've talked about how young this team is. Yep. For one reason or another, there's been so many young players out here, offense, yep. defense, right, injuries, in this case, suspensions. Yep. What can this do? when you're looking ahead for the future, especially knowing that these young guys are going out there in a freaking moment like this, where you need to win this game or next week's game, yes, it still means something in this state, but yeah. now it means so much more. I mean, especially with our, our utilization of our younger guys and really putting them, you know, trial by fire, I think what that's going to really do, you know, because keep in mind, if you get – some good Ed rushers. And honestly, and I'm just going to be completely honest, I don't think if we had Birch here, we'd just be this unbelievable defense. He, we, he was good at rushing the quarterback, but not what we need. And we don't need one, we need two. But if we start getting in a handful of good rushers through the NIL program or whatever, heck, I, I would love to see if Nick Harbour could be the next Devin Taylor. That'd be phenomenal. But if we could start getting a little more edge rushers, I mean, if you don't make us have to be in cover zero every single time, we could actually drop eight and, give, and get pressure in three seconds. I mean, we could be one of the top defenses in the nation. Before I ask the next question, and, and Kenneth, we'll talk about the O-line shortly. Joe, you have the number out there to show it again. If anyone wants to call into the program, now is your time. Release the floodgates. Here we go, and let's keep things rolling. Defensively, again, they did some good things tonight. And we've talked about this and trying to compare it a little bit to last year. And what I mean by that is 
you played South Carolina State, you played Charlotte in those back-to-back weeks, and certainly there were some valleys still along the way. But the point being is being able to play those teams when they did, when they did last year, they were able to gain confidence. And without that, they wouldn't have beat Kentucky last year. I know Kentucky was banged up. I know Levis didn't play. But my point is, similar to last year, you had an opportunity to play Jackson State. You had a chance to play Vandy. Two teams that you should beat, and you did. But the timing of that, the timing of that to me was massive. Sure, it would have been great if it was earlier in the year. But you play those two games. Then the competition just continues to go up, continues to go up over the next couple of weeks. Kentucky, Kentucky better. Yep. You beat them tonight. Yep. Clemson, they're going to be better. And they're playing for some really good football right now, despite what happened pre-Tyler from Spartanburg call. So I bring that up, though, because can you see a difference with this team? I know the offense, it wasn't one of their better nights, but defensively, special teams-wise, Joe mentioned that. I mean, shoot. Kai Kroger had a phenomenal game. Shout out to Hunter Rogers, too, the long yep. snapper. Yep. Hell of a, he's doing a great job all season. Getting down there, had a couple tackles. Got yep. a down inside the uh, the five-yard line. But can you sense just something different with this team, especially from those two units? I think Clayton has probably gotten to a certain point where he knows that it's – hope he's okay. You all right? Yeah. help? Yeah, the kid fall into a bush behind us. <laughs> He's gonna go fix him. I got security taking care of the kid that fell into a bush. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that kid, uh, that kid is, uh, yeah, you know what? That kid's probably had too many uh, high seas tonight. You know, uh, he needs to go mix in the water. <laughs> um, golly, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, I think, I think. With, yeah, I think that there's been a lot of what do you do with Clayton after the year, regardless of how the defense looks. That was my question really going into this post game was what do you do with Clayton if the defense looked as good as they did that first drive? And they had a couple ups and downs uh, here and there. But for the most part, I feel as if Clayton just is, just opened up the bag. And, you know, we've done a bunch of 3-3 three, three stuff. I still think 3-3-5 three, three, is our best defense front. We did a bunch of 4-2 stuff. And the moment we hopped into 4-2, they ran all over us. And I just don't feel like – Which is crazy. You'd think having because two of the our – last the last two years – Years, they've had a lot of success. I'm yep. talking about USC's defense. That m- maybe we should have expected this a little bit, just because of the success they've had over the last couple of years. Players change. I get yep. that. Um, that's why you can't make any assumptions. But I-, I thought they did a fairly good job. But like you said, though, they when it was ironic because you felt yep. like when they would go to that, it would just be lights out. It wasn't like that all the time. But they certainly played well. Well, especially for the fact that what one of our our weaknesses just based off of just being younger is our linebackers and one of our strengths is having so many defensive tackles that are really strong and know what they're doing i mean heck like we had a backup d tackle as one of the top sec players of the of the the week one week but for some reason i think we're going to that three three we can actually keep two solid d tackles only one defensive end and let our linebackers kind of run pull the safeties in i think that's where it's going to be um i yeah that's my question too what what big red just said um i don't know i don't i don't know what the deal is with what to do with Big red ask is clayton white going to be this year's marcus satterfield Dude, this is the question. This is where I and this is where I would love to see what the fans think because I I can't put a finger on it. I mean, this is a situation I kind of mentioned this a while back, and I'll kind of reiterate it. At a certain point, you know, you get paid millions of dollars to produce, and if you don't produce, no matter if it's your fault or the kid's fault, they make moves because that's what college football is. But I mean, that's the thing that's so frustrating though is that you're seeing progression and you're seeing the guys figuring out. And if you also look at the defense of I mean, the, the the tools in the tool bag, it's a bunch of young kids. I mean. I, I could tell you that if you gave Nick Saban a bunch of freshmen and sophomores, he'd probably have some issues too. It just doesn't matter at a certain point. But that's kind of my question, and I, I don't think I don't think I have a really hundred well, percent answer to it. You know what the conspiracy theories are? You know, people are going to put the tinfoil hats on. They're going to say that he's not calling the defense, and you know, this is bottom line is this, and I've said this before, and I get it. I get it. It's easy sometimes just to point at a, and I know more so with college football, it's going to be the coach. And especially these guys are getting paid a lot of money. I get that. And it comes with the territory. I'm not right. saying that Clayton White or any of these coaches throughout the course of the season didn't deserve blame. But I bring this up because it was real easy just to point and say, hey, this was the problem. It wasn't as simple as it was just Clayton. The issue was at times, and we've talked about this many times, a lot of it had to just do with simple execution. I mean, again, I don't want to bring back the freaking Florida game, but you have a, you have, you have, DQ Smith coming out the outside on that that blitz from safety, and you don't contain the quarterback. But here becomes a conversation: Who's that fall on? 
at the end of the day, and this, I mean, well, I'm as, sure if, as an O-line coach, if my O-line doesn't produce, yeah. if they're young or I just have a bunch Correct. of guys who are mentally inept, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if the O-line doesn't produce, that's on the Correct. O-line coach. Yep. And that's my issue with Lonnie right now. I know Lonnie doesn't have a ton of really talented guys, and I don't think replacing him fixes the young thing. But Lonnie's had this position for, what, six months now? Clayton's been here for years, and we have not seen that progression. I don't know what you do, and I don't think it's fair because I think Clayton actually is doing a good – or. The phrase that I think Clayton knows what he's doing, but at the end of the day, if the guys aren't producing, it that who else does that fall on? I'm not saying it's right, it's just part of the job. I'll tell you right now, we'll have plenty of time to talk about that in the offseason. But if they can play the way they did tonight against Clemson next week, there might be people who were ready to get Clayton's bags and throw them out of town, they might be ready to build a statue for him. Um, it so was, <laughs> we'll for see. what it's worth, it was great that Clemson won tonight. I hope that their confidence is excessive so we can really really chop that down that's to make me happy intern joe who we have on the phone and tell him to just speak up loud for us yeah yeah we got seth on the line <laughs> seth you ready for me yes sir all right go ahead boss Losing them a little bit. Seth sounds like he's in the bathtub right now. We're losing him a little bit. Call back in, Steve Steve. Seth, if you're watching. <laughs> yeah. I don't know Call exactly back what in. he – I called a couple things, and I I mean, yeah, I, I think – correct if I'm wrong, Seth, but I think the kind of the gist was that, you know, how do we kind of carry that over to the Clemson game? Yeah. I mean, one thing that I was concerned about, and I, I hope that the coaches see this and kind of understand that, is that I thought that we had a great game plan, but I thought they ad the Kentucky adjusted and we did not. And I thought our halftime adjustment was better, but then we didn't – I, I felt like we were not – and I could be completely wrong. This is just my assumption. But it felt as if we did – they adjusted and we didn't adjust to their adjustment. And I think coaches, you know, if you're an offensive coach, the moment you get done with the offensive drive, you look at the film, you look at, you talk to the players, figure out what they're doing, what was their adjustment, and how do you counter that? We've got, I feel like we got to be better at countering what they're doing. And I think our coaching staff, if we can do that against Clemson, because again, they've had a crap year. They're still a talented team. And they're a team that's gaining confidence right yep. now, right? I mean, we joke about the whole Tyler from Spartanburg thing, but they've really been able to rally around just that moment. Yeah. And I know it's not just the you know a guy calling or you know perhaps there's a conspiracy theories as uh, you know it was someone's uh, relative that called or something. Yeah, I still I still don't think that's an actual person <laughs> calling me a conspiracy theorist. But also feel as if you know watching the UNC game today, I just I think the UNC is also packed the bag in. I, I, there's all that conversation about and that's a real and that's a real thing. Oh, yeah. we, we talked about Michael Skarnecchia and. Unfortunately, I'm sure you've been part of teams. I was part of teams in college. You get to the end of the year, and there's just guys on the team that just say, screw it. Like, I'm just done. I'm done with yep. the year because our record is what it is. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Marcus Lattimore was in town last week, but he, you know, he's been following the program. But last week, he mentioned to me, Mike, I was in the building. I was in the building in this, the feel that I get, it feels like there's life, there's energy. Like, yep. it doesn't feel like it's death. And, what it reminded me a lot of was the time period when I was there from 2010 to, I think he played, played through 2012 and then he declared for 2013. But I bring that up because that's a guy that will call it for what it is, especially when we talk yep. uh, away from the camera. And that's a, that's a bold statement, but I bring yep. that up though, because yep. I think, I think you're seeing it. I think you're easily seeing it because if this team folded it in and just said, screw it, or, you know, the Clayton White stuff. It's easy to yep. use Clayton White as an example. You know what? Oh, he doesn't know what he's doing because I'm sure, you know, everyone, Twitter, cousins, yep. brothers, whatever, maybe a girlfriend, they continued to stay buy in, bought in. And because yep. of that, they've been able to go out there and win three straight games. And certainly this fourth one will be the toughest of this stretch. Yep. But if they're able to do this, if they're able to do this, I, not saying that it excuses everything that we saw earlier from the season, but what does that say? about Beamer? What does that say about this coaching set? What does it say? Never mind the fact of if they win next week, what does it say that they're actually in a position where next week means even that much more? And, you know, the, to start that, I mean, you got to understand getting people like Nick Harbor with the NIL budget that we have, we're getting guys who believe in the coaches and believe in the program. And the two things as a coach that make a coach good is not only knowing the stuff and knowing how to coach it, but getting your guys to believe in you enough to where you want to work harder, be better, 
for that coach. And you can see that a lot with the people that follow Shane. I mean, you watch how many times we flip recruits that we should have no business flipping. It's solely because they believe in our program. They believe in us as a fan base, but they also most importantly believe in Shane. Um, you know, going to the Clayton White thing, I, you know, that's one thing that I'm, I'm very intrigued to see what happens at the Clemson game and the bowl game because we've had a, we had a, a rough uh, stretch there for a little while, but I feel like the defense is getting a little better. Do we continue to progress? Do our guys continue to push themselves? Keep in mind, guys, they've been doing this since July. Their bodies are tired. They're exhausted. It's not as if we're having some, you know, ranked season. This is a rough season. You should be frustrated, but our guys are still out there fighting. If they're fighting because they believe in their coach, Let's see what that does and see what kind of momentum that does has going into the next season. And I see this comment. It says beating Clemson back-to-back is bigger than oh, a bowl. No I don't disagree, but my point being is you beat them, you're also able to get 15 extra practices for a very young team. Sure. So while sure. it is obviously, and I get it, I've been down here covering the Gamecocks now for eight years, that game can change your season. That game can change your season. Having said that, having said that, the opportunity now that you have – to be able to have your cake and eat it too, that should not be overlooked. When you have a guy like Lenora Sellers having an opportunity to get extra reps, knowing that that quarterback room is going to be very young next year, unless you do dabble in the transfer portal for that position. But we'll get into that. Looks like Joe has another caller. Joe, what we got? Yeah, we got Zach on the line. Zach, go ahead. Uh, I just want to say um, the defense uh, really showed up tonight. Um, there's a lot of fighting this team, and I'm really proud of the, uh, the team and how they – rallied after a hard October in hearing all the noise. So that's really good to see and that Beamer's culture really is taking effect. Zach, we appreciate it as always. Joe, you have any you have any thoughts? I've, you've kind of just been over there. Just anything yeah. uh, that we're talking about you want to just chime in on? Yeah, well, I, I like Zach's uh, comment. We, we appreciate the call as always, Zach, um, and anyone who calls in. But, yeah, I mean, I think the defense stepped up in a very big way tonight. Um, you know, they've been, you know, trying to work things out, rep things out in practice, trying to, you know, put an end to the struggles. And, you know, it, they talked about the definition of insanity, trying the same thing over and over again um, when it doesn't work. Um, and so they, they switched things up with the 3-3-5. It worked well. It seemed like the guys played well off of the 3-3-5 too. When they put it in, you know, you see you saw guys fly to the football. Big game from Nicky Minwari, DQ Smith, um, Debo Williams as well. Um, the penalty, you know, obviously you want something different, but the, the hit was pretty clean um, on the broadcast. I don't think it was targeting maybe unnecessary roughness because he was sliding, but Debo Williams, um, you know, playing well again, flying all over the field, playing with intensity. And I think that's what this defense has missed is just intensity through four quarters of this game. Um, well, Joe, so let's go to that. Let's go to that comment. Cause I'm looking at a tweet right now. I want your opinion on it, Garrett. So DJ Swanger actually weighed in immediately after that happened. And what DJ tweeted out was, if the defender already is going for the hit and the QB uh, slides too late, that should not be a penalty. Yeah. So I'm always going to be very biased when it comes to defensive players. I, I think the challenging part is there's been so many rule changes in recent years where certainly we want to look out for player safety and it starts with the quarterback. I get that. I get all that. Having said all that, they're, they're, when you're in the game, when the live bullets are going on, Certainly there's times when you see a quarterback giving himself up and you're able to say, all right, you know, and there's sometimes guys, you know, they, they fly over them and they don't call a flag for that. The challenging part to me watching that play and then going back and watching it again, and it doesn't even have to be specifically this play. Maybe you want to weigh in specifically. Maybe you can just weigh in on your thoughts on it in general. The challenging part to me is this. If the quarterback is starting to just slow down a little bit, right? Excuse me. If the quarterback looks like he's slowing down just a little bit, and as a defensive player, you decide to back off and he doesn't and he runs your butt over, that could leave the defensive player getting seriously hurt. So while we talk so much about player safety for the <laughs> player safety, it's typically just the offensive side. Yes, you know, I know people don't want to talk about the DQ Smith with the targeting call because it was more so the old school, the stuff that you learn first day of Pop One or, you know, uh, the sticker on the back of the helmet, you know, this is a dangerous weapon, you know, do not spear, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Like, that's the reason why they call because they're looking out for him. But in a play like that, I, I don't know what Debo could have done differently because there, of the way the angle there was. There isn't anything. And, there isn't anything he could have done at that point. Garrett, go ahead. But, yeah. No, but but I think that's the point, though, is that yeah. I think that you're having a lot of guys in boardrooms or referees that have not played the game of football in a very long time expecting college athletes who are good athletes 
but expecting them to change their entire trajectory of their body in midair at the drop of a hat, like at a, you know, at a split second, that's not physically possible in the NFL in college for anybody. And yeah, I was about, to, I was thinking about the Kenny Pickett thing. And this is a situation though. And you got to understand this is kind of a handshake agreement between the defender and the, and the guy with the ball is that if you decide within, you know, a, a, a three yard space, Hey man, I'm going to slide. So you don't get to knock me out. There we go. We agreed, you know, firm handshake call a day. But if I'm running at a guy and that guy is staring me in the eyes, I'm going to murder that guy. You chose to come at me as a defender. My job is to knock you out. That's what I'm paid to come here to do. If that guy at the last second slides, I'm sorry, man. You knew when you were supposed to slide and you chose not to. You signed this contract. Accept the terms. So I think we all agree it's crap. Having said that, I will say this because I'm not going to lie. I got a little nervous when I saw that because the first thing I'm thinking is if he gets ejected, if he gets targeted, they're screwed because they've already been thin at linebacker. We've we've given praise. We've given praise for what Bam Scott Martin has done. He had another phenomenal game tonight. Mm -hmm. Five tackles. He also had a QB hurry. Debo, though, my goodness, eight tackles, one TFL. If you lose Debo in that game, again – and it's not like I'm saying stuff to make my like, oh wow, like Mike, you're really Bria Bryant with that comment. It's like, no, I think anyone freaking would have known. My grandmother would have told you the same. You lose a player of Debo's caliber, they would have been screwed. Yep. And it, and you know, I was fortunate enough to be in my friend's seats where they have the uh, the TVs, and I was watching the Florida Missouri game as well. And it literally happened almost in the exact same time as yeah. the Florida Missouri game. Uh, I think you saw that where the guy's yep. trying to jump over him. He's trying to throw his body out yeah. of the way, and they still almost gave him targeting. At some point, as for the referees. Y'all got to understand the why and just do the why. Debo, Debo, Debo got away. I, I, I also thought targeting as soon as he hit him, right? And that's a spot call, yeah. I think, is why he kind of got the unnecessary roughness because you see a violent hit like that on a slide, your instant reaction as a ref is to throw a flag because it's, not, you know, 95% of the time there is a targeting or some kind of call on that, on those types of plays. But, I mean, Debo, it was good fundamental tackling. He stayed low enough to avoid the targeting call. If he – if he were higher up or making you know a, a shot at his shoulder even like to try to blow him up it would have been a targeting and an ejection so shout out to Debo for staying low and just good fundamental tackling and wrapping Leary up where he did because he would have been ejected very quickly if he would have been any higher and tell me if I'm wrong I'm trying to find it because South Carolina I believe the second and third quarter they actually were going in the same direction it's not like a video game where you're just going, you know, you can decide which side you want to defer, which side you want to go first. Sure. So I think it took place, and I could be wrong. I'm trying to remember if that play took place in the second quarter or the third quarter. The reason I say that, and if anyone out there can help me, that'd be great. Okay, so the reason I say third is because if, if, and fortunately, and this is why I'm saying this is why you celebrate, again, obviously it was a it's BS, but if they did call – an ejection there, then not only does he have to sit out the rest of the game, and certainly that changes things for South Carolina a lot, but now he has to sit out the first half of next week. So uh, the reason I bring this up here is because things like this, unfortunately it was not the case, but when you're talking about first case like for South Carolina, and I'm not saying just for South Carolina, but for any team in, in their situation, not only do you have a, a chance to impact the game that's going on that week, you have a chance to impact the game the following week. So I'm glad they didn't call – because if if he did get ejected, it wouldn't have surprised me just because of how we're seeing things called these days. And there was a, a play last week, and I'm blanking on the teams, all that kind of stuff, but I think most people know exactly what I'm talking about with all over social media. But there was a play last week – I want to say Pac-12, but the guy was – the, 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 the receiver was in the air, and the defender jumped in the air. His helmet was going towards the defender trying to hit him in the helmet. That's what we're trying to avoid. If it's not that, let them play ball. Which, heck, especially with what was going on in the beginning of the game, we talked about this when we were watching the game, but there's so many times where Kentucky got to do so much physicality after the play. And what I said was, if y'all don't tighten this up right now, you're going to have a game that's out of control. That's the ref's job. It's not to get nitpicky over targeting stuff that's not there. Uh, Shout out to Travis. He said it was the second quarter. Yes, it was in the second quarter. So in the event of that, He'd have to miss the rest of the first half, and then he'd have to sit out the rest of the second half. That would serve the the um, the suspension, if you call it that. Uh, but again, it didn't happen. I just wanted to bring that up, though, because 
something like that could have had a big impact on tonight's game. Offensively, and we talked about this before, and we'll get into the offensive line. We talked about Xavier Leggett. I mentioned this over the last couple weeks. Joe and I, we've talked about this. Outside of two long runs, I think it was 40, 43 yards on the opening drive against Jackson State that Mario Anderson had. And then last week against Vanderbilt, towards the end of the game, Anderson had a uh, 70, 73-yard run. Outside of those two long runs, when USC wanted, when they wanted to run the football, they weren't able to do that over the last two weeks. So that was something I was a little concerned about. You head into tonight, you're banged up in the running back room. Mario's going to have to do a little bit more. It's not on Mario. It's Excuse me, it's not all on Mario. Some of it has to do with him. Some of it has to do with the O-line. Some of it has to do with just the entire offense. But because they weren't able to establish a rushing attack when they wanted to, what happens? Well, you become one-dimensional. And I think that was the reason why we saw USC starting to do things where fans were like, what, what are they doing from a play-calling standpoint? And I'm not saying I agree with everything they did. I would have, if you can't get that going, well, what do you do? Screen passes, swing passes. I know fans don't like that, but an extension of the run game to be able to slow down that pass rush. What was just your overall thoughts on what happened tonight? And do you think that played a big part as to why USC's offense was the way it was for the majority of the game? I thought, so I have been a huge fan of Loggins all year. I thought he's done a phenomenal job. I felt like the last couple of games, the offense has gotten a little bit stale. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know if it's a, an issue with personnel or trying to do certain things that we can't do. I don't really know what the issue is, but, but like he was extremely creative the first half of the season. I feel like it's been a little bit more easy to guess. I mean, I called a couple of plays and I should never call. I should never know exactly what they're calling. Um, but I, I will say, I think that one of the things, I know somebody mentioned the offensive line earlier, and I do want to kind of answer that question. I think one of the issues that I've been noticing, and I think a lot of defensive are kind of picking it up, is that in terms of pressuring Rattler, you don't need to bring cover zero. You can do one high all day long, and heck, you can even bring four. But if you isolate our offensive linemen and remove them from letting to do double teams to kind of uh, work their way through the line, we are really, really bad at one-on-one -on -one pass protection. And it's been – it's it's becoming glaringly apparent. And there's a couple of times I, I like Gargiulo a lot. I think he's a really good dude, and I'm happy he's here because we'd be screwed if we didn't have him. But there are a lot of times where all they would do is take their big D tackle and he would just go left to right and kind of fish his way back there. And it was just enough to where, you know, if, if the center gets pushed back four yards, the pocket is pushed back four yards. He is the depth of the pocket. And that happened a lot tonight. I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, heck, we might need to start going into sides, but I do agree completely. I thought our running backs saved us a ton. They had a lot of really interesting blitzes to kind of take advantage of that isolation pressure that we're so bad at covering. But our running backs did a lot of – I mean, chipping too. A lot of people don't realize that, but when running back chipping a defensive end or a defensive tackle can typically save the play. And our backs, especially at this point in the season, all banged up, wanted to go shove your body into a 350-pound guy. That's big. We mentioned Mario Anderson. DJ Braswell got out there a little bit. These guys had to step up in the running back room. And I talked about that as being one of the keys in this game is that when we talk about looking for production now, right, next man up, when we're talking about the running back room, I think it's so easy for the majority of people to say, well, that means, okay, he's got to go out there. He's got to run the ball. This He's got to be able maybe to be a short yardage guy. No, no, no. That's a part of it. But sometimes, too, your responsibility might be just to be able to block because – Mario Anderson, as good as he is, as talented as he is, as good as he's got and got better with pass blocking in the pass pro over the course of the season. Guess what? He can't be out there on the field asking him to do touch the ball 15, 20 times on the ground. I'm not saying that was exactly the case tonight as we have the grass from uh, raining on. It's like a snow globe, but hey, gotta get the field looking good for tomorrow. Next week, excuse me. But you're not going to be able to have him do that plus have him block the number of times that you need him to and still be able to have those legs to be as fresh. So I think it was certainly big, certainly big to see some of these other guys step up. With the game tonight, though, keep in mind, DJ Braswell has now played in five games. So he will not be able to maintain a year of eligibility. We talked to Shane Beamer about that earlier in the week. And it's one of those things where you have to, have, you have to be candid with players. You have to say, hey, look, this is the circumstances that we're in right now. These, this is the situation. We really need that next man up. You're that next man up. Here's your opportunity. I know you'd love to be able to save a year of eligibility, but we need you. And that's exactly what happened. What does that say, though, about Braswell? What does that say about some of these other players? We've seen it at the tight end room. 
Connor Cox is another player who's been asked to do that. Some of these true freshmen. What does that say about the, this young team? Who again, there's probably some players that we would have said at the beginning of the year, or even at the middle point of the year, oh, they're probably going to redshirt. But because of the circumstances, injuries, there's been some suspensions now. Other guys have had to be called into into the mix, and they've done a good job. No, I mean that's that's nothing new to football. Um, it's just it's part of the game, and I think if these kids didn't step up, I think that'd be more of a character issue. But I feel like all those guys really understand how the game works, and you just gotta. If it's your time, it's your time. I mean, heck, I won the red shirt, and I played freshman year and played those four. Like at some point, I, hey, I love your intentions. Shoot, you just matter. played. You just played one snap, and it's gone. Yeah, yeah, that was. Oh, <laughs> you, back in the day, you didn't, you didn't have the uh, luxury back in the day. This rule's only been around for about five years, where you've been able yeah. to play four games, and if you play in four or less, you can still be able to maintain your year of eligibility. Now, having said all that, having said all that, keep in mind the NCAA they have not finalized it yet. Being able to play in a fifth game in a bowl game, or if you're in the college football playoff, you can play up to six. That rule was last year. Now, it looks like it's on its way to being able to get approved again this year, but that's not on the table quite yet. So just, again, keep that in mind when we talk about some of these red shirts. We'll get into that a little bit on Tuesday, um, but th wanna, that's something to keep in mind, though. There's a, a, a couple of questions about sellers that I do want to kind of touch on. I think these are great questions, and I, I was really excited to see sellers. I thought having men there was really good. Joe, do you have someone online? Uh, no, 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 I don't. Okay, I wanted I to chime in sure. about Lenoris, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I thought that was great, but I, I completely agree with what you're talking about. There's one thing to mention the slant, which I guess Kentucky had a great answer to the slant because that was all I kept on screen up there was all Kentucky's doing to us is slants and hitches, and it's working great. Why are we not doing that? I think with that cover two, cover four defense that they were kind of sitting in, that's that was where they took it away, uh, took away the slant because I, I, all day, I was like, just throw a freaking slant. That's got to be open. It never was. So, I mean, I agree with you. I don't know what the deal is. I'm assuming Kentucky took it. I love the seller stuff. And I think, you know, this game and, um, I mean, honestly, the next two, if we go bowling, uh, are great times for sellers. But I couldn't agree more. The first time I saw sellers in, my first thought was we should be in 10 personnel. Hey, to the right. look who's here. Sam, we're, li we're live right now. TK, Sam, how you doing? Sam, Sam, I know I can't, I can't get the microphone to reach you. We're live right now. What do you want to tell Gamecock Nation? Go Gamecock. We're going to beat Crimson. We're going to get Crimson next week with the flag. Hey. And you know the guy, right? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Darude. Darude signed a flag. Oh, did he? He did sign a flag. Hey, TK, you, you've you been doing this for years. How would you describe the energy, how loud it was, the people who weren't here tonight? Unbelievable. And he came to me, right? They tried you the flag, yeah. <laughs> but he said, no, 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 not yet, you know. But <laughs> next time, yeah. And so I grabbed the flag, all the lady came to me, took a picture, you know, and drunk, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, hey, you're not going to you're not gonna have to mix in a water today. We're going to finish up the show, though. Sam, we will talk later this week. You're the man. You're the man. You're the man. Awesome to talk with TK. I'll tell you what. You know, I've put some of the photos out there, Carolina Calls. Yeah. So with basketball season going on, Sam will be juggling both, especially how busy it is because there's been four home games to close out the year. He'll be taking care of things at the kitchen. Then he has a dinner break. What he's been doing with that dinner break is on my uh, Thursdays, he's been heading over to Carolina Calls just to wave the flag for 15 minutes. He's outside of Carolina Calls, and he's just waving the flags, waving the flag. I just I gave him a lot of credit. He's a man. I give him a lot of credit. South Carolina legend. If you see him, you have to say what's up, as we did. All right. Yeah, let's go back to Sellers for a minute. Yeah. After the grounds crew comes over here, it's going to look like we're in a tornado. I was going to say it looks like it's raining out there at Williams Bryce. Golly. I will find grass in my laundry. That's how you know it's live. People. Well, it was like, it was like when, you were playing, when you played on turf. Like, I still oh, yeah. have some college socks, and oh, I still have pieces. Rubber. Yeah, the rubber pieces. No, but goodbye. That point, you know, the first thing I thought whenever we put uh, sellers in was we should be in ten personnel, three by one, throwing bubbles. Because I know, I mean, this is the whole thing. Whenever we put uh, DK in during the Wildcat, what are we going to do with DK? We're not going to be throwing verts. We're going to be running the ball. So all you do is do one high, if that, put the safety at eight yards, and you stop the run. I I love that we put sellers in, and I think that he's a way better. I mean, he should be the Tebow of this team. Where yes, of course he can especially run the guy now, over. Especially now, because even heading yeah. into tonight, you play tonight, which he did. That's game yep. number three. You play against Clemson. That's game number four. We'll have the conversation if they go to a bowl game. But to me, 
I'd rather play him in these two games. I'm saying if the NCAA yep. weren't to approve that, yep. Yep. because yep. I'm sure some people are going to bring that up. Someone asked us that last week. Yep. But I, I want to go back to something real quick, though, yep. about DJ Braswell. So early in the game, South Carolina had an opportunity to make it 14 nothing. Sellers gets tackled up the one, and Braswell got called for a hold. It was a bad hold call. It took South Carolina out of, I say out of, touchdown range. They had to set, set up for a field goal because they were just so far back. But I bring that up because of how early it happened. And I know some people aren't going to look at it maybe as like, oh my God, like it's the biggest thing in the world. We, you know, it's very similar to Nichols Harbor when he had the drop against Texas A&M. Yep. Yep. And then what happens? He goes out there and responds. That could have been one of those things because I'm sure he got, he, he got his butt chewed out when he was on the sideline. Yep. And he's playing a little bit more now because of the injuries. And what happens? He goes right back out there. He made some great blocks. You mentioned it wasn't just one-on-one -on -one blocks. Yeah. It was being able to do some chip blocking. Yeah. Things that I'm sure he hasn't had a lot of opportunities to be able to work with the ones in practice throughout the course of the year. And he was able to do that being thrown right into the mix. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, let, let's go back to, you know, the, the post game we talked about with the Furman game where, you know, we had a little bit of Nick Harbor. Where everyone was just like, where in the world is Nick Harbor? Nick Harbor's learning the offense. Look at where he's at right now. Like, there were a couple times, and I, I think it was – we'll wait for this. No, no it's snowing. Um, the, you know, the, Nick had a freshman play today where he was supposed to block a guy off the edge, and he just didn't block the guy well enough. You know, he's still a freshman, and, and Nick is still learning. But I do agree, you know, Travis and Frederick made a good point, you know, about, about sellers. I agree, and maybe that is the answer. Hopefully, I'm just too stupid to see it that all those plays were just set up for the the rival game. Hope I hope I'm wrong. I hope that I am just completely mesmerized next week with the game plan. I just hope that we're not being way too protective and just letting him run the ball. I, I think we have a much more talented player than that, and I think we have yep. a lot more we can do with him. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck. Chuck, I'm bringing your comment up here. I'm going to pick on you for a little bit. Unfortunately, the best part of the game was Sandstorm DJ. Oh, Unless you were playing some fantasy football and you didn't get the numbers you had, look, this yeah, this wasn't a high-scoring game. This was very old school. It was slug it out. But in the end, you know, you found a way defensively. They stepped up. And to me, to me, it was an exciting game towards the end. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, a hell of a finish. It was. This was one of the uh, – this was probably my favorite game of the season to actually – physically be at and not because it was just this epitome of offensive defensive play calls and just a massacre that was a game of football where two teams really wanted it two coaches really needed it i mean i the one regret i have so far we should have had this the the beamer shades to start this off i there were some kentucky people with those shades on trolling us at our house after they won is intern Joe? Intern Joe, do you have your shades on uh, on standby? No, actually. Well, so, I mean, I, I got the shades I've, got the, I've got the dowel shades ready to roll, but I mean, that's it's not the same thing. It's a different. Hey, that's a different fail. thing. I'm not gonna. Let's do this. I, Joe, I did have a pair of pit vipers, but they're lost somewhere <laughs> at Augusta National. Well, I know you. I know. Is it Hale? Our good friend Hale McGranahan. He works uh, at one of the other media outlets in town. Does a tremendous job. He actually asked Beamer though. You know, are you going to have the glasses? And he said, no, we'll wait and see if Justin King had a bit of because he did something really, really good. They, they, uh, well, they were they playing and I think in the drawer. Yeah, that was fantastic. Shout out. Did to you, Justin could King you, could you hear that on TV? What's up? Could you hear them playing soldier boy at the end of the game? Oh, yeah. But so the, the football team did a video this week of Shane opening a little, uh, cabinet. That was nicely done. Justin I didn't King even, I didn't even see bit. it. Fantastic. I didn't see it. You got it. I didn't even yeah, see it. It's, it's unbelievable. It, they dropped Joe, another gem. I want to hit the ads yeah. because when I when we come out, we'll have final thoughts. But I also want to ask Garrett his oh, thoughts. Goodness. We'll get into that. I also want to ask Garrett, and it's a big picture question. Yep. While South while while South Carolina's special teams and their defense was able to build some momentum these last couple of weeks, the offense takes a step back tonight. Yep. What do you do? How do you move forward with it? So we'll get into that. But let's hit those ad reads first with our good friends, Liberty Tax, Joe. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Our good friends over at Liberty Tax. Tax ID is an uncertain feeling you get right before doing your taxes, but you don't have to go through it alone. The tax team at Liberty Tax in Irmo, Lexington, and Columbia will walk you through the process, clear up any confusion, and guarantee you'll get the biggest possible refund or your money back. It's tax time. If you're in a hurry for a refund, call on the tax team at Liberty Tax. Fast, accurate, and guaranteed. On the other hand, if you think you might be owing Uncle Sam, 
talk to the Liberty Tax Team to make sure you're not paying more than you should owe. They'll find every possible deduction for you. Locally owned and operated, staffed by tax professionals from your neighborhood. Open 99 on weekdays and 9 to 5 on Saturdays with multiple service options. Start the Liberty Tax mobile app or through the desktop portal. Make an appointment or just walk in. Give a call to upload your tax documents. And when you come in, your return will be ready to review and sign. Give them a call at 803-462-5576. Once again, on your screen right now, 803-462-5576 for all of your tax needs this season. And today's show is also brought to you by our good friend Clint Hammond of the Movement Mortgage. You see his sponsorship above every GC Live show, not just the GC Live post game show. He's been a long time supporter of Gamecock Central. That's why when our very own Wes Mitchell and his wife were in the in the market for purchasing a home, who do they call? They called Clint. He helped them find the best rate, made that process easy, as well as former Gamecock quarterback Perry Orth and his wife Shannon. Do what those two did and so many throughout this area by giving Clint a call. At 803-771-6933. And I know you know Clint very well, and you understand that process because you're in a very similar business. Yep. So, guys, if you have any questions about real estate, let me know. Uh, Garrett Anderson on Facebook, Instagram, and that kind of stuff. Got questions about the housing market, what we're looking at, where things are going to go in the near future. Happy to help in any way I can. If you have any questions about rates, money, things like that, Clint's got to go to. See? Garrett Anderson. He was getting things done as an offensive lineman. He's getting things done for you now. Post post-college career. All right. We got a lot of offensive line stuff that people want to get into, a lot of offensive oh, stuff in yeah. general. Where do you want to start? And we can kind of wrap things up, and uh, I got to put the official word out shortly. But uh, you do not have to mix in a water tonight as the Gamecocks are 5-6 and six now, one win away from going bowling. But let's get into the offense. Where do you want to start? I think, you know, we're talking about what do you do in terms of momentum. I feel as if, you know, 17 to 14 is not the way you want to win games as an offense. I mean, that I, I remember, you know, my earlier years of Carolina, we were winning games, you know, 10 to 3, 10 to 7, and it, we're leaning so heavily on the defense. You don't – you're not as an offense, you're not excited about the win. You're concerned as to what the heck you're doing wrong. And so I think, you know, what do we look for in the Clemson game? What do we look for in the next two games? I think, you know, I, I, Loggins, I know he has the tools in the tool bag. I think he's going to give a couple guys back. But, you know, I think we've got to be creative, and I think he's going to get that done. A lot of questions about what you know, what do you do with the offensive line at this point? I, there's nothing you can really do with the offensive line in the sense that the issue is talent. I, I think Lonnie's coaching as best he can. I think the guys that are in that group, and I agree with what Garjulo said months ago. You're never going to see a group work harder than that group. That's why half of them are injured. Is because they're not taking practices lightly. They're not taking the weight room lightly. They're working their tails off. The problem is not their work ethic or their want to. The issue is talent. you got to look at their offensive line compared to the other offensive lines. We just don't have the guys there right now. And if and we have some guys who will develop, but you don't have many freshmen come in and are dominant offensive line. Tree's done a great job, but you know we still got um, the other Anderson blanking on his name right now, Marquis. Marquee. who is a phenomenal talent once he learns how to play the position. And so I think the answer is let's get – Once he gets guys. healthy too. That that too. I think I think this this is one of the seasons we're going to look back and see some guys who, when these guys are seniors, when they were put into the trial by fire as freshmen and sophomore, you're going to see a really, really good group. But we're watching this growing pains live, and it sucks to watch. But, you know, in terms of what are we looking for going forward, I think some more creativity on the offense. I think, we you know, we got to do some more screen stuff. Doing a lot. I, I don't know why we haven't – we've gotten, gotten away from this, but just throw the ball up and let Leggett or Harbor just head tap somebody and come down with, you know, a, a vertical here and there. That has worked for us, and I want us to go back to it. Intern Joe, what's your final thought tonight? Yeah. Put it up. Yeah, guys, I mean, very big win for South Carolina. Um, offensively and defensively, you executed in all phases. Um, offensively, when you didn't have the wheels turning as much, um, you still found a way to get it done. The atmosphere in williams Bryce Stadium was fantastic proving why you are one of the premier destinations in college football in terms of home field advantage. Um, you know, Williams Bryce for a, a four and six team going into this game for Williams Bryce to be as packed as it was shout out to the fans for making it as loud and um, shout out to Darude for showing up and embracing the atmosphere um, to its fullest extent. Very good game from Spencer Rattler. Another big game from Xavier Leggett. Um, Nick Harbor looked good in his one catch. Defensively, your leaders led, um, and you were able to execute defensively when you needed it the most. You rallied off of the 3-3-5, which is something you needed to see this week. But Bam Martin Scott um, played really well, and so did Debo Williams. Your tight ends also looked well. It was nice to have Trey Knox back. 
Josh Simon really executed as well. So all around really, really good win for South Carolina. You want to tune some things up, but I mean, you have momentum going into Clemson. You're still playing for bowl eligibility. Everything is still intact to, you know, go out on a high note. You just have a lot of work left to do. And, you know, Clemson is no joke. They will run through you if you beat yourself. So um, all the work is left to be done next week and we'll see what happens, Mike. And John, I'll say this, John Edwards says, you know, students need to stay for the whole game. I know there's an extended corner, but at least from my viewpoint, that place was packed for the beginning of the game to the end. I mean, if, if, if it, the wind kicked up, though, this is one thing that's happening. Uh, a lot of the kids are wearing way less clothing. And when it, I look, I'm in a hoodie. I'm 350 pounds and I was cold. Like I, I for some of these kids, it might have been just fighting hypothermia, not even just trying some to the leave. The drinks right. maybe worn off. Yeah, it's the cold, cold the bourbon. Yeah, dude, it was cold. Like I. Yeah, I get it. I don't blame a lot of them for the guys who are here. Let's see. It's freaking cold. Let's see. I mean, I'm not a meteorologist. David David says Dave, Beamer called out the students. Must have called said something uh, in his presser. But the, so here, and I guess here's my point: is that good or bad? I don't know. I'm I'm assuming it's along the lines of what John Edward Kruger was saying. Oh, and John Some just said same leaving. Thing. Yeah, well, maybe. Well, I was where where I where I'm sitting at. I'm down in the corner looking at the jumbotron. So. Um, Again, like you said, is is maybe the temperature went down. I mean, the, the extended part was yeah. Uh, but I'll so, but I'll say this: the the early air, yeah, the early weather report, and we do this on Gamecock Central. But I will make sure that we put this out there so that little Johnny and Sarah and the rest of the freaking crew, everyone knows. I don't know any names. I mean, Billy Bob. I mean, there's yeah, some you know out. southern names down here, right? Uh, John Wayland's we, and all we have that. Yeah. Too, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so next Saturday. The low is going to be 45 and the high is going to be 64. That's your early weather report brought to you by nobody. So, look, yeah, bring a sweatshirt, you know, because at some point that liquid jacket, it will wear off at some point. For some people, it won't because they'll just keep layering up. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Well, I think, you know, I saw a couple people leave, too, when it became 10 to 14, when they got the second touchdown. And I felt that you had this combination of it's gotten freaking cold. The wind's kicking for some of these people. They're wearing summer clothes and the and they're getting they're sobering up. It's just that I I don't think it was a we hate Carolina football, but rather I'm dying. I just want to get the hell out of here. It's hard for some students to stay the whole game. And I I give credit for the bulk in the center of the student section that stayed the majority of it. I think as long as you can have the center of it front to back, I think that's a win. I think that side section gets a little love because there's only a certain amount of a lot of tickets for both the bottom and then the top. And then so there's a little bit of miscommunication. And it's late, too. People want to get to five points, get to TLC. Sure. But, I mean, and listen, God loves comics. I hear you. But this is South Carolina. We're trying to survive 100 (laughs) degree weather. We are not used to this. I have so many people that move down here that see us in hoodies and 65 degree weather. This is just the way it is down here. We're not used to that crap here. It is quarters of season. Big Red, we'll, no question. Big Red, we'll talk. We'll talk more about it next week. But yes, it's been it's been confirmed that President Trump will be in attendance. But we'll, we'll get into all that. We'll get into all that later That's next so week. Funny. But we'll continue to talk about tonight's game. My final thought before we wrap things up, and I and I hit on it a little bit earlier about the turnovers. Being able to have the defense playing the way they did tonight, after what they did last week. Okay. And not just what they did last week and not just what they did tonight, but the fact, the fact that you were in a very similar situation as you were in comparison to a month ago against Florida. And the difference was tonight you were able to find a way to get it done. So the defense starting to play their best football of the season, heading into the most important game on your schedule, on top of the fact that your special teams is starting to play at their best at the most important time of the season, heading into your most important game next week. Kai Kroger, yeah, it hasn't been probably the season that he would have liked. It hasn't been the season that many of us were were expecting. He had a phenomenal game tonight. I mentioned long snapper Hunter Rogers and just some of the plays that the special teams, not just one unit from the punting standpoint, but all these units have been doing over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I get it. Missed PAT last week, high snap because of the weather. But all in all, they're starting to look like the special teams unit that we expected them to be because we put them on a curve. I bring that up because, look, offensively, it wasn't their night. They had a complete game last week against Fandy. They were sharp. In all three phases. What you hope for now is 
the offense says, all right, we know what we did wrong. We're going to be able to regroup. Hopefully, on Joyner will be back in the mix. We'll see what happens. By the way, Juice Wells, maybe he's possibly out there. I don't want to get people's hopes up too high. But there's a lot to be, be excited for from an offensive standpoint. And when you have Xavier will get out there and Spencer Rattler, it starts with those two. But defensively, what we saw tonight, and again, with the special teams and how they've been looking the last two weeks, they're starting to gain that momentum. They're starting to gain that confidence at the right time. And you certainly need that next week against Clemson because it's not going to be as just simple as, okay, Spencer Rattler is just going to throw it up to Xavier will get all game. No, the defense is going to have to do some good things, just like last year, right? Defense made some key plays. Special teams made some key plays. You need all three phases next week. Well, and I'm, I feel like I've been very hypercritical of the defense. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind, and I feel like this, I'm, I'm very guilty of this. You know, if that game is, you know, 35 to 14, I don't think we talk about anything the defense does wrong. We don't talk about the missed turnovers. But the situation was, was that those moments were so crucial because the offense wasn't doing what they needed to get done that those felt like need to have plays. And so I felt like the defense, you're right. I mean, I, I think the defense did play really well, but the offense has got to do their part if we want to beat the next, hopefully, two opponents that we got. And again, the final stat that we will say it once again before we close thing out. South Carolina, in the last two years at home, when they do not force at least one takeaway, they are 0-3. But in that same time span, when they force at least one at home, they are now 10-0. Three turnovers tonight that defense forced, and all three of them were crucial in playing a role in winning tonight, especially Nick Eamon Worry coming up with a huge, huge interception in the end zone. That saved at least three points right there for the Gamecocks. If you missed any of our show, head on over to the Gamecock Century YouTube page where you can watch this show in its entirety. Or if you're a podcast listener, head on over to the Gamecock Central Podcast Network. If you guys are stuck in traffic right now, go back. You missed the show. It's all right. You'll be able to listen to this show tomorrow or heading in at work. And be sure to tune in to the walkthrough tomorrow plus GC Live talking Tuesday nights. New time now. Six o'clock on Tuesdays. We're actually, Joe, I say all that. We got to actually double check because on Tuesday, Shane Beamer is going to be at Carolina Calls. Mm -hmm. So we're going to actually put a pin on that one. We'll get back to you. We'll let you know when the exact time will be on Tuesday night. But one last thing South Carolina, they won tonight. No need to mix in a water tonight, my friends. Columbia, be safe. South Carolina, they improved now to five and six on the year. From two and six. From two and six. Ooh. That next week's game was going to be big regardless. Yeah. It's Clemson. But this game feels like a bowl game. It feels like a play-in game in a lot of ways as you get ready to take on the Tigers. We'll see you back here next week at williams Bryce Stadium under the lights as the Gamecocks get set to play the Clemson Tigers in the Palmetto Bowl, looking to hopefully punch their ticket to a bowl game. Enjoy your Saturday night, and enjoy the rest of your weekend, folks.